Hey there, folks. Welcome to Broadband Deployment News. If you are an ISP or a community or a consumer or any kind of stakeholder in the broadband process, uh, the FCC is seeking comment on their broadband data collection challenge process. I'll be right back with more. Thanks for joining me, Rick Husey here with Broadband Deployment News. So I want to take a look at this, uh, make sure that you're aware of it, because again, this really impacts lots of folks. There could be just anybody from uh, a consumer who lives in a location where they look at the broadband map and it it doesn't look right to them. They Maybe they look at it and they think, you know what, I can't get fiber here. I can get DSL. I can't get fiber or uh, that kind of information. Or it could be a uh, community that's trying to determine uh, particular Areas where it says there's service and not could be internet service providers that that want to make challenges. Any any folks uh, might be interested in this. So I want to make sure you're aware of it. Take a quick quick look at it. Um, so I've linked to this page where you can download the uh, public notice on this. You see here FCC's broadband data task force seeks comment on challenge process, and you can just uh, scroll down there and click that, and that's what we take a look at here. And um, just gonna look at some highlights it's a you know it's a pretty long document and it's you know a lot of it's made up as, as these often are when the fcc is seeking comment it's just a bunch of example questions to kind of get you thinking uh so they these are the things that they want to know so they've come up with their own questions hey we'd really like to know about this but of course you could you could comment uh on anything uh related to this uh and that would be fine but again there's a lot of sample questions in here things to think about so you see here the dates. Uh, so the comment dates, uh, you can comment up through February 19th. And then I guess they'll reply to those comments on March 5th or before, let's say March 5th or before, uh, as, when, as when they'll comment or reply to those comments. Uh, so you see here just a little background pursuant to Section 802, blah, 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 of the Communications Act, amended, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the FCC is required to submit a report to Congress that evaluates the challenge processes and considers whether the commission should commence an inquiry on the need for other tools to help identify potential inaccuracies in BDC data, that's broadband data collection, and improve the accuracy of, the, of those data. And there's some background here, lots of background stuff. So basically, just a real quick background for you. So what we're talking about here, if you're not familiar with this, is the FCC national broadband map, which uh, is supposed to reflect whether or not a specific address in the United States and the territories, I, I think, I think territories are in there, um, can get uh, broadband at that location and if they can what you know what is delivered there so for example it should indicate whether that's a broadband service for location so if you're in a residential home for example you should have a, a dot right on your roof uh, if you live on a farm you should have a dot right on the structure or structures that are supposed to be able to get broadband not on the cow shed out in a field somewhere uh, so that's the first part is making sure that we have accurate locations that should get broadband and that was done through the broadband data collection uh, fabric that was put together by CostQuest and then has been going through some iterations. And then the internet service providers uh, overlay where they provide service on that fabric. And that's what creates the broadband map, the national broadband map. So it shows what should get service and then what providers are providing service there. And then they need to upload their maximum advertised speed, whether their latency is under 100 milliseconds round trip. Um, that's basic. That's basically what's up there. So that is the data that we're talking about here. But then there's a challenge process. So once that fabric was available, and then all, you've got all the locations that are supposed that uh, have broadband or are supposed to get broadband there by whichever provider or providers, then that can be challenged, uh, and that can be challenged, like I said, by a host of different uh, organizations or individuals, from the consumer to the internet service provider that's there or to uh, communities, to uh, other kinds of groups uh, that would have an interest, stakeholder groups that would have an interest in that. Um, so that's what we're talking about. And they are trying, they're seeking comment as to whether the challenge process is user-friendly, is it getting you know enough information, what changes can be made, those kinds of things. Uh, so I'm going to skip all their uh, background stuff. There's a few things I just wanted to highlight. So here they're under the discussion. Again, just a little bit more information. I thought there was some interesting stats in here. Um, about the whole challenge process. So you see here the, the BDC allows for consumers, tribal entities, governments, providers, and third parties to continually improve and refine the accuracy of the broadband availability data through two challenge processes, one for the availability data submitted 
by fixed and mobile service providers and another for the locations represented in the fabric. So again, that's two pieces of what make up the map. The fabric would be the broadband serviceable locations. Is this structure at this particular point on earth <laughs> something that should get broadband? And then once that's there, are, are the internet service providers, that is their data correct? Um, both types of challenges allow for consumer challenges submitted directly through the National Broadband Map Interface and bulk challenges filed in the BDC system. So consumer can make a challenge on the map right there. You can go in and say, hey, this is my home and it says I should get this and I don't, uh, that kind of thing. But everything else, you know, if you're going to do a bulk challenge and say, you know, if it's, a com if it's a community or an ISP, an ISP might come in and say, hey, it says there's no service here, but we do provide service here. Or it says um, this particular service provider, you could, uh, ISP could challenge another service provider. Or a community could challenge internet service providers uh, saying that they're not providing the service that shows that is on the map. Um, evaluation of fixed availability challenge process. The, the fixed availability challenge process is designed to allow consumers and other parties to challenge whether the national broadband map accurately reflects the availability of a fixed broadband service at a specific location as reported by a particular provider. This challenge process allows stakeholders to dispute whether a given type of fixed service, for example, fiber to the premise, is reported at a reported maximum advertised upload and download speed is available at the challenge location. Commission staff, and that's important as far as, is that available? It's not saying, are you getting that? Um, I think that's a, a totally separate question. So if a provider, for example, says, we have fiber at this location, we provide gig fiber, that's the maximum advertised speed that we have at this location, a consumer can call and say, I'd like your gig fiber service. If they can't get it, then that is inaccurate on the map. Now, if they have gig service and the consumer says, I'm only getting 800 megabits per second, that's that's different. That's not this kind of a challenge. Um, commission staff review challenge submissions in accordance with the commission's rules. And if a filing is accepted, it's forwarded to the provider being challenged, who is then required to submit a response within 60 days. If the provider disputes a challenge, a second 60-day period begins wherein the provider and challenger are encouraged to work, to work together toward a resolution. So in other words, a uh, consumer goes on the map, they say, I challenge this. The FCC looks at that. They send it to the provider. The provider then has 60 days to review that. And then another 60 days where the provider and the, the person challenging that are supposed to work together. The provider could say, hey, I know you called the office and somebody said you couldn't get the service, but they were not aware that we installed fiber to your neighborhood uh, a month ago. So you can get the service and we'll make sure. And that could be an example of a resolved dispute, for example. If the provider disputes a challenge, I said that, I think, um, yeah. If, however, a resolution is not reached, the commission staff will adjudicate the challenge. The national broadband map will be updated according to the result of the challenge. So if you don't, if the consumer and the ISP don't come together and the FCC makes a determination based on whatever facts they have, and if, I guess if they don't have, it might, I think if they don't have enough facts, if the ISP doesn't come back and say why, uh, if it just get, falls to the cracks, then they're going to go ahead and grant the challenge, I would think. Between November 18th, 2022 and November 16th, 2023, approximately 3.7 million fixed availability challenges were accepted and submitted to providers for response. The vast majority of those challenges were submitted through the bulk challenge process. In total, 140 distinct entities submitted bulk fixed availability challenges during this period. Of the total number of fixed availability challenges served on providers, more than 2.2 million were conceded by providers, resulting in updates to the map. Roughly 866,000 challenges were disputed by providers and ultimately adjudicated by the FCC. Of those, approximately 276,000 were upheld by the FCC in favor of the challenger, resulting in additional updates to the map, while approximately 590,000 were overturned by the FCC. In total, more than 2.5 million updates to the national broadband map have occurred as a direct result of fixed availability challenges. So obviously this has been a successful process. They're trying to see if they can make it easier to use and... Uh, even more efficient or better. It's also important to note that there were all kind the challenges that are talking about here, you know, November, November to November, 22 to 2023, 20, was a time when we knew the fabric was not really as accurate as it could be. And everybody knew that was going to be the case going in for the first time doing this. And then uh, there were lots of errors as far as internet service providers because it was new to them as they were updating, doing some of their first 
uh, I think it was the first because I think it was June when they first started uploading their broadband availability data. A lot of internet service providers made mistakes as they were doing that. They were doing it wrong. They had a problem reconciling their data and where they could provide service with the fabric. So we, a lot of these challenges took place early on and it's getting better and better as we go. There's going to be fewer and fewer challenges as we get this stuff straightened out. Um, let's see what else we got here. So given the heightened standard of proof, it mentions here, as noted above, the commission rules established a higher evidentiary standard for governmental and other entities than for individual consumer challenges. So again, consumers can challenge right there on the map. So it says, given the heightened standard of proof that applies to challenges of availability data by entities or individuals who do not own or reside at or are otherwise authorized to request service at the challenged locations, we seek comment on whether we should require those challengers to submit data via the BDC system pursuant to the data specifications applicable to bulk challenges. For example, only permit consumers who own or reside or are otherwise authorized to request service at the challenge location to use the National Broadband Map interface to submit fixed availability challenges. So in other words, if I am an ISP and I'm looking at the map and I see some homes there that I actually serve, you know, can I go in there and say, hey, you say I don't have service there, I do. Or should that just be limited to the consumer is the question that they're asking there. Uh, are the benefits to allowing non-consumer challengers to submit challenges directly through the map interface, are there benefits? Uh, assuming that we continue to permit both individuals and entities to submit fixed availability challenges using the National Broadband Map Interface, should we allow individuals to provide additional information or otherwise expressly indicate that they reside at or are authorized to request service at the challenge location? And I would say, yeah, I didn't know, I didn't know how that worked, but if you're going to take a, if you're going to have somebody be able to challenge something at a specific address on the broadband map, I think it, you should have to indicate whether you are the resident or not, or whether you are some other entity. Could be a community person, could be somebody at the state, could be an uh, internet service provider. Um, I think you need to, you should have to indicate that. And I don't know if you have to prove it, but um, let's see. Should we instead require challengers who do not own? Or, or reside at or are authorized to request service at the challenge location to provide additional information to explain or substantiate their relationship to the challenge location. Should we do both? I think they should do both. So again, the consumer should be able to indicate, hey, I live here. Uh, somebody who's challenging that who's not the consumer should be have to state why they are challenging that. They should be able to state, uh, I am the internet service provider and I know for a fact that I've got fiber running to the curb to that home. They haven't ordered it. That could be what it is. Maybe the consumer is saying, I don't I don't get gig broadband. Well, you got to order it first, right? I mean, it could be that it's running right to your curb and you don't get it until you call your internet service provider to order it. So yeah, I would say both of those would be a good idea. But again, this is open for comments. If you have a different opinion, I'll, at the end here, I'll show you where you can uh, get that uh, or where you can comment. Valuation of the mobile availability challenge process. I'm not going to go into that, but they've got information about mobile there. Uh, mentions here, just an interesting fact uh, between November 18th, 2022, and August 31, 2023, nearly 190,000 mobile on-the-ground speed test results were submitted to the commission, all of which were submitted directly via the FCC speed test app, resulting in 35 cognizable challenges and 18 corrections to mobile wireless coverage data displayed in the national broadband map. So for mobile, the FCC has this, te this mobile test app that you can get and you can test and you can challenge, submit a challenge that way. Um, valuation of the fabric challenge process. So again, this prior thing that we were talking about was the national broadband map and challenging availability data. Here we'd be talking about challenging whether you're, whether a location is serviceable or not, or should be serviceable. Similar to the availability challenge process, challenges to the fabric data help to identify missing BSLs. That would be a broadband serviceable location and inaccurate data associated with existing BSLs. Fabric challenges may be submitted on an individual basis by consumers or in bulk by governmental entities, service providers, and other third parties. Given the amount of work required to resolve fabric challenges, including manual review, the commission has generally announced the date by which bulk challenges to a particular version of the fabric should be submitted in order to be reflected in the next version of the fabric. So they wanna get all of these challenges in by a certain point and then have a kind of a cutoff and say, okay, everything in prior to this date will get in the next map, but they can't be accepting challenges, you know, right up to the point where you're going to publish the map or they'd, they'd never get it done. So that's the point there. 
Once the FCC has processed and resolved Fabric Challenges, bulk Fabric Challengers are able to download a comma-separated value CSV file from the BDC system, indicating how each challenge was addressed. Individual challengers are notified of the outcome of their challenge via email and can see the results of the challenge on the map. Challengers that are accepted, challenges that are accepted are incorporated into the next version of the Fabric dataset. And again, that Fabric dataset then determines uh, the, the national broadband map that that home or location or whatever you got, that rooftop is going to have a map pin on it that says it should get broadband or will not. Maybe, it, maybe it's something that's tape, taking a pin off of the map. Because as I mentioned, sometimes on, in rural areas, you might have buildings or structures that were identified as broadband serviceable when they really aren't. It's just a shed or something like that. Uh, between September 12, 2022 and October 2023, the commission received approximately 9.23 million fabric challenges. And again, this is during the time when we knew, uh, you know, basically the way they created the fabric was, uh, yeah, it was really quite remarkable. I mean, they, they had to come up with, again, every single structure in the United States that was supposed to get broadband. So they started with, uh, you know, looked at satellite imagery and tax records and all kinds of stuff to try to come up with that. And then they had to do machine learning, uh, you know, to try to figure out which roof lines were the ones that should get broadband on larger properties. It's a little bit easier in a residential neighborhood, but if you got a large property um, in rural areas, you got to try to figure that out. So they had machine learning. They tried to teach uh, their system, their computer systems to do all of that. So there was, a, you know, there were some errors in, in the early going uh, during that period. So again, they received 9.23 million fabric challenges. Similar to fixed availability challenges, the vast majority of fabric challenges were submitted through the bulk fabric challenge process. In total, 461 entities submitted bulk fabric challenges during this period. Challengers submitted roughly 7.66 million challenges to add new locations to the fabric. Um, and roughly 1.57 million challenges for other categories of fabric changes during the period. The FCC upheld over 497,000 of the challenge code one challenges. That was the, uh, was that the first one? <clears throat> yeah, that was the uh, adding to the fabric. Um, and then, and that, so that was to add new fabric locations, approximately 1.2 million of the challenges for other categories of fabric cha changes. And that could be removing from the fabric, could be moving something. Again, the wrong, the wrong location, I suppose it might have included that. So, um, the need for other tools. So uh, this is interesting. So the BDA requires the commission, following the opportunity for notice and comment afforded by this public notice, to consider whether it should commence an inquiry on the need for other tools to help identify potential inaccuracies in the data relating to broadband internet access service that providers report and improve the accuracy of the provider's biannual BDC data. We see comment on whether additional tools are necessary to help identify potential inaccuracies in the availability data that broadband service providers report in the BDC. Does the fixed availability challenge process allow challengers to, to submit appropriate types of evidence at adequate levels of granularity to support in support of their challenges? As an example, we see comment on whether and if so, under what conditions speed test data could indicate a lack of availability of fixed broadband service. So, um, and what says lack of availability of fixed broadband. So I think what they're saying is there, they're not saying if, if you, if the operator says you can get gig service and you're only getting 800 or 900 when you do a speed test, they're not so much concerned about that. They're more concerned about whether uh, an area, let's say, says it gets 25 by three, and that would get squeaky over the line of being served or at least not unserved. Um, and then from 25 to three to 100 by 20, you're underserved. So again, there's another area, you know, let's say somebody says they provide 100 by 20. Well, if speed test data indicates that's not the case, you know, is that information that should be incorporated in this? I know there are a lot of people that are going to be saying, yes, that should be the case. Uh, because, um, you know, again, that's a concern that you'd be marking something on the map that um, really would indicate that somebody gets broadband or they don't. They're either unserved or, or they're underserved or they're not. So that's important. So I, they're asking about that. Um, the BDTF, Broadband Data Task Force, is currently unaware of any mechanism whereby a speed test website or application would collect data from an individual or entity that is not a subscriber of a fixed broadband service that would demonstrate that a service is unavailable at a specific broadband service location. So if you are the customer, the consumer at home, you can run a speed test from your home, goes through your 
cable modem or your ONT or your whatever uh, fixed wireless device. Um, and you can, you can do a speed test there, but um, somebody else who's not going through your network out from your network to uh, the speed test. So they're saying that they don't know of a way to do that where you could uh, do that bulk. Um, does any such testing pr platform exist? So they're asking if, if anybody knows of anything like that. I mean, you can do, uh, I think one thing that, um, that the FCC may be looking at already, and I think some, uh, some interest groups are looking at, is looking at speed tests in a various area and saying, you know what, there's this, this particular provider says they're doing, they can provide 100 by 20 in this area, but when we look at speed test vari data from various consumers, not just one consumer, but various consumers in that area, it looks like most people are not getting that. So that's something to look into. So that's one way to do it, I suppose. Uh, so they say, does any such platform exist? If so, how would the commission encourage its adoption and use? Similarly, should the commission accept challenges to the maximum latency of fixed availability services? And if so, how would it collect reliable challenge data disputing latency? Now, one of the things about latency is it's pretty, it's not that high a bar. It's 100 milliseconds um, round trip. So really cable modem service, uh, fixed wireless service, certainly fiber, um, even satellite service from somebody like Starlink, a low Earth orbit satellite, should be able to comfortably be under 100 milliseconds round trip. Um, so I think that's less of an issue. DSL, I don't know about DSL, but DSL is really not going to be a service that's going to be providing uh, broadband anyway, because gen in general, it's really hard to get over um, certainly 100 by 20 with DSL, and sometimes it's under 25 by 3. So uh, I don't think latency is that big of a, an issue. When, you, when you're talking about 100 milliseconds, latency is important. Don't get me wrong. But as far as purposes of the requirement on the broadband map, 100 milliseconds uh, round trip, it's not a big deal. Now, if you're talking about low latency and getting, getting latency lower and lower to be able to do latency sensitive, sensitive kinds of applications like gaming or autonomous vehicles, those kinds of things, that's a different story. Um, so uh, I think that's it. And then you see here uh, at the bottom is the comment filing procedures. So you can see electronic filers where you can go, paper filers, filings can be sent by commercial overnight courier. So there's information about how you can file if you are a person that wants to get involved here and uh, file your comment. There's information at the bottom there and how you can do that. So again, I linked to this where you can download this document. You can check out the document. I also wanted to bring this up real quick because it was talking about how um, there's a gap in time as far as when you can do a fabric challenge and when that actually gets into the fabric. Because again, they can't. There's a there's a lot of manual stuff that's going on, and they need to look into that. So, this is the broadband data collection site, and I went ahead and linked to this as well. And then down here, you know, it talks about what the national broadband map is and the fabric locations and the broadband availability. So this kind of describes and a lot of what I was talking about there and what's explained in that document. Then you've got your uh, key dates here. Uh, so, you know, this is for 2024 and it's pretty much been the same. Uh, I think it's going to follow this every year at, around these times. So you see uh, the filing window started in January. ISP filing window opens for fixed and mobile availability. And that was at the really at the end of December, at the very end of December that opens. And then ISPs have till March 1st, uh, the filing deadline for fixed and mobile availability data, and that's as of December 31st, 2023. So anything that ISPs are uploading as far as being available has to be as of December 31st of last year. So if a, if a service provider is installing, uh, is going down the street today, a street today and installing fiber, uh, that does not count. So that will not show up on the next fabric because it's not as of December 31st. It needs to be available for a consumer to be able to order it and get it as of December 31st. And then you've got March 8th. This is where they're saying by March 8th is the best opportunity for bulk challenges of location data to be included in version five of the fabric. So um, if you are doing challenges, you need to, as you see here, you would want to get those in, let's say prior to March, it says the best opportunity. I think they say prior to that. So that's your best opportunity. That doesn't mean if you get in after March 8th, if you get in March 15th or something like that, it still may be looked at, but I think they're kind of trying to put a little line in the sand here and saying, if you want to get it in, this is your best opportunity. <clears throat> then we've got May. Broadband map is updated to show fabric version four location data and availability data. 
as of December 31st, 2023. If you go to the map today, it's showing you data as of June 2023. Bulk availability data challenges are accepted to the December uh, 31, 2023 data. So again, that's the stuff that you're trying to get in by March 8th. <clears throat> Individual challenges accepted to both availability and fabric data sets in May. And then in June, we've got Fabric version 5 is released to licensees to prepare availability data and location challenges. Bulk Fabric challenges accepted uh, to version 5 as well in June. In July is the next filing window. So uh, again, ISPs will be completing their filings uh, on March 1st, and then they will begin it again in July. And that will be data as of June 30th. So that uh, fiber that was going down the street today will show up in the June 30th uh, window as far as uh, that would then be considered broadband uh, availability there. Then September 3rd is the ISP filing deadline for fix. So they, they start in June. They, they got to finish by September 3rd. Then again, we've got September 9th being the best opportunity for bulk challenges location data for the version 6 of the fabric. And then uh, in November, We'll have the broadband map. So, you know, again, we'll see we'll see a new broadband map. They'll make an announcement in May, and they'll make an announcement in this later in November when they have this other data. Then you got the same stuff here: bulk availability challenges accepted to June 30th, 2024 data, and individual challenges accepted to both availability and fabric data sets. So that's in November, and then the end of December, maybe last day of December, is when they'll open up again the filing window for the next year. So this is an ongoing process. Uh, as I mentioned in the early, the first year of this, there were all kinds of challenges and corrections. And each time we go through this process, there's gonna be fewer challenges and corrections. And at some point, there's really gonna be very few challenges and corrections. It's really just gonna be new stuff, either neighborhoods that go away. You know, if a house is uh, torn down and nothing's built there, there's not broadband, it's not, it's not broadband serviceable anymore. Uh, more likely, if a neighborhood is built, um, then you've got, let's say, a new set of 100 homes that should be getting broadband, then they need to show up in the fabric. And then as soon as a broadband service provider comes in there, one or more service provider comes in there, then that will show on the map as having a broadband available. So this is an ongoing process. But hopefully, um, as we get through this year, um, it will become uh, more and more accurate. And the other thing that's going to change, I, I should have mentioned, actually, because there's a lot going on here, obviously, with bead funding, um, there's a lot going on with um, not just new houses being built, but new locations getting better broadband. So there's a lot of locations, even prior to bead money coming out, talked about some in New York just yesterday, I think, um, where there's uh, 200 and some odd 20 million, I think, that's going to New York for tens of thousands of uh, new homes and businesses that are going get, to be getting broadband. And as that happens, that will then be a change in the in the broadband availability at some point when that ISP is up and running. Um, it has to be up and running by a certain point. And then when they report their data as of that date, then that will be changes to the broadband map. So that's going to be an ongoing thing as well. But eventually, hopefully, as everybody, you know, all the bead money comes out and uh, we've got lots more people on with fiber and we've got uh, the remainder on with fixed wireless getting broadband of, uh, you know, at least over 100 by 20, then there'll be really fewer changes then because then the only changes would be and you'll still have you'll still have availability changes as far as better service so somebody might have gig service and then their isp says you know what we're going to go ahead and give everybody two gigs uh or 10 gigs is going to be our highest maximum speed so those kinds of changes will be ongoing so as every year twice a year i should say this process happens but uh accuracy wise should be pretty accurate uh moving forward especially after this year Thanks for joining me today. Appreciate it. If uh, you learned something new, give me a like on the video, please. And if you're not subscribed, click the subscribe button, ring the bell, and you'll be notified when I'm live. See you next time for Broadband Deployment News. Take care. Bye-bye.